Thanks for having us here today and giving us an opportunity to share with you some of the work we've been doing over the last several years. Uh, I know we've already had mentioned the fact that we do approach this work as independent researchers, but I want to emphasize why that's so important to us. Uh, as most of you know, uh, initiatives like uh, the Opportunity Scholarship Voucher Program or other things like it can be quite divisive when people think about whether or not they choose to be supporters or opponents of a program like that. We think it's incredibly valuable for anyone in that conversation, regardless of your position, to have a firm and deep understanding of what the context of the program is about. And so we've worked for many years to gather more than just the data that are available publicly to help share a, a broader story about what Opportunity Scholarship vouchers look like in North Carolina. We've tried to do that in such a way that we have uh, avoided, uh, as was noted, identifying uh, uh, any particular bias one way or the other. And that's really hard to do. Um, I'd like to ask you all to please call me out today if you feel like that we, that we crossed that line, because part of our speaking to you today is to figure out how we're communicating our information and our messages, and you're a good audience for us to try that with. <laughs> I uh, used to teach a policy, uh, education policy class for a number of years, and I taught it from what was called a values perspective, where we talked about the different and conflicting values that come into play when we talk about education. And I asked my students at the end if they could figure out where my own values rested. And it was a good class if they got it wrong, and they frequently got it wrong. So I hope to be as, as neutral today as, as I've tried to be in our work, uh, but please stop me at any time during the presentation to ask questions. I ran through this last night, and if I stop through without any uh, breaks, I can do it in 35 minutes. I'm not going to try to break any land speed records, but I want to make sure that you know that there's plenty of time available for questions. Also, I'll note. We are only going to be able to highlight today uh, one or two uh, major findings or learnings from each of the segments of our work to this point. There's quite a bit more out there that we've already worked on. And uh, we have three publicly available reports on our website. We'll share that address with you later. We have two more reports coming out in the next couple of weeks, I think. And then we have a sixth one that we'll talk about at the end, which is our first efforts to get some uh, better understanding of some of the academic impacts of a program like this. And we'll talk through uh, what we've done to make that happen and also some of the challenges and limitations. So with that rather lengthy preamble, I'll get started and tell you a little bit about what we have to share today. Uh, first, we'll give you a quick overview of the Opportunity Scholarship uh, Voucher Program. I assume most of you are familiar with the details, but I want to make sure that we all start off on the same footing there. Uh, and the, the, the details have changed uh, from session to session a little bit, but, but not so much that I think that, it's, uh, that the program looks significantly different from year to year. We'll then talk a little bit about the demographic characteristics of the participating student population. This is something that my colleague uh, Steve Porter helped us with. We had uh, data from uh, the North Carolina Education, uh, NCSEAA, State Education Assistance Association with that. Uh, we also had data from the applicants to help us understand, and from the Department of Public Instruction, a little bit more about who these students are and their families. We then were able to administer, and we're in our second year of administering it, uh, statewide surveys. One survey went to uh, all of the heads of, uh, uh, of non-public education entities in the state, and we had a pretty high response rate from them, something like 30 or 40 percent. We have, for this presentation, some of their uh, uh, feedback from the first year of the survey. The second year of the survey, we're still in the middle of processing, so by this time next year, we hope to be able to talk a little bit more about some of the trends we see across years. We also were able to uh, administer a survey to all applicant families, regardless of whether they uh, were awarded uh, a voucher or took it or declined it or not, and we'll talk about some of the reasons for that, and that helps us to get a little bit of information about what goes into the decision-making process for a parent or a family that has entered this process seeking a scholarship, and then whether or not they ultimately choose to take it or decline it or for other reasons like that. Uh, again, we've only got for this presentation results from the very first year, but we should very soon have uh, results from the second year as well. And then finally, one of the things we've been working toward is trying to figure out a way to add that critical but not completely, uh, it, doesn't it doesn't tell you everything, but we wanted to add that critical piece about how a program like this impacts student academic outcomes. So often when we talk about education policies, whether it's this one or something else, our minds immediately go straight to test scores. And there's good reason for that. We want to know how does a program impact students' learning. But I think the value for us of the way that we've gone about this work is to remind us, and we hope all of you, that there's so much more involved in any education initiative than just the test scores alone. 
Uh, the test scores, though, are important, and we'll talk a little bit about what makes it challenging to uh, evaluate that piece of this program when we get towards the end, and that'll give you some hint of what we're trying to do here in the coming months. So that's a, that's a look at what we're going to talk about. Again, please feel free to interrupt me at any time with questions or something's unclear. There are one or two points in here uh, that are a little technical, and I might ask Steve to help me with those, but also feel free to stop us and make sure that, that you're uh, uh, following along with what we're trying to present. A little bit about the program itself, and again, most of you know this, uh, the program was enacted in 2013. It was first implemented in the 14-15 school year. Um, it can be used to cover or reduce tuition and fees for non-public school education, and that part matters here, uh, to either cover or reduce tu tuition and fees, and we'll talk about how that's different across states. Uh, it provides state-funded uh, financial support up to $4,200 per year. Uh, there's a little bit less available depending on your family's income level, but in general, the amount that has been awarded has been close to the $4,200 uh, amount every time. <coughs> Uh, and you'll see some of the growth here on the, on the bottom line. This has as much to do with increasing knowledge about the program as also increasing size of the program. I think many of you know that the legislature has expanded funding for this program over the last several years. Uh, from 1,200 students initially to 5,400 last year, we do not have this year's numbers for a very important reason. The scholarship is a rolling award scholarship, and we'll talk about why that is. It doesn't have to be, but that's the way it's played out in, in implementation. So we won't know until this year uh, gets even closer to completion how many students this year received the funding. What does it look like compared to other states? We picked a few out here. There are others that matter. Uh, first of all, they're not all the same in terms of the program design, and uh, this came up actually in one of the comments we had from one of our focus group settings. Uh, that in North Carolina, it's a voucher; the money goes to the parent, the money goes to the parent, then to the school. Uh, in some places, like Florida, it's a tax credit. Uh, the voucher value changes significantly across states, and we'll talk about why that is. You'll note that Louisiana's is quite high, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the average voucher award, uh, though, comes out about the same across states, a little bit lower in North Carolina right now. Uh, that fourth line, can participating schools charge more than the voucher value? Another important line there, and we'll talk about what happens with that one. School-specific admission standards, private students, are they eligible, what's the accountability, and then how many participate. So I want to highlight a few of these to talk to you about why those differences might exist. The first one is, the, as I've mentioned earlier, that in Florida it's a tax credit rather than a voucher. Now, and when we, when we did our focus groups with some of the school leaders over the last uh, year or so, several of them mentioned that they uh, would have preferred it if it had, if it had uh, um, um, been set up as a tax credit, and I think that's largely because of the, uh, the timing delays and the paperwork involved in the transfer of funds all along. If you made a switch to something like that, though, like in Florida, it does change in some ways the way that families think about using it. So we don't put that as a positive or a negative. We just note that there's more than one way to administer a program like this. Another note, the, Los Ange the, the Louisiana value. The reason why the Louisiana value is so high is because Louisiana's rule is that any participating school has to accept the voucher amount and not charge anything else. And so because of that, schools that typically might have a much higher uh, uh, tuition are going to be really disincentivized to participate if they have to take in a student who costs them 20000 to educate, but they only get four or 5000 back. So the Louisiana number is probably higher for that reason. And that's what I'm noting here, is that in Louisiana, if you participate, you can't charge more than the voucher amount. In the other states, you can. So in North Carolina, uh, the average uh, cost for a private school education is about seven or $8,000, and it ranges quite broadly from a very low number to a very high number. Uh, and no matter what your school uh, uh, charges, you can continue to, to, to charge that tuition regardless of accepting the Opportunity Scholarship voucher. It does, though, make decision-making somewhat challenging for some of these schools, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the principal's perspectives. Are private students eligible? So in North Carolina, that's a no with an asterisk because in general, the, the, the number of students, the, the students eligible in North Carolina are those who are coming from public school with a couple of exceptions. Kindergartners, those who are entering school for the first time, uh, students who are in military families and students who are, who are uh, have been adopted or in foster care. So there's a, a small fraction that might have been in a private school setting before that would still be eligible. For the most part, though, this is a program that supports students who are moving out of uh, the public school sector into the private school sector. In Florida, that's not the case. And again, this is part uh, tied up into the the fact that it's a tax uh, tax credit rather than a voucher. Questions? Sure. 
Um, so that's the entry year. Yes. So after that, they can continue to apply. Yes. The, the difference of, of five, between 10,000 and 5,800 5, in the Louisiana thing, th does that imply that the students that did, I mean, that the schools that did accept the vouchers were not discounting their tuition for their students? Yes. Yeah, so they are not able, they're, if they participate, they're not allowed to yeah, charge I, anything I else. Yeah. Since it was only valued at 5,800, one would assume that if the school's tuition was 8000 they would have gotten 8000 Oh, so in Louisiana? Yeah. Or? So the schools were not contributing. Were the schools contributing a discounted tuition to the students? That I can't answer. So like in North Carolina, uh, for instance, there are a number of schools that have set aside some of their uh, already existing scholarship money in order to cover the difference. Uh, in addition to the scholarship money they offer other students. I don't know, for instance, much about the Louisiana program to know how they've handled that. Uh, but un undoubtedly, there will be some who have set aside their own internal scholarship money to offset some of their own costs. I want to make a note here about the accountability uh, rules across states. They are also quite different, uh, sometimes very much so. Uh, in Louisiana and Indiana, for instance, uh, the state test is the required uh, measure of academic achievement. In Florida and North Carolina, it is a norm reference test of choice. Uh, in, in North Carolina in particular, uh, the, the, the statute states that it should be a nationally norm reference test. And there are hundreds of nationally norm reference tests, but there's about five or six that are commonly used in North Carolina and pretty consistently so. So you'll note down below the final thing here is the participation rate. I think that you'll see, and, and I don't want to draw any direct conclusions here other than to note that the rate's quite different in Louisiana, but the program is set up quite differently there too. Uh, it's not as appealing for some of those schools to participate perhaps because of the way the funding structure is set up, or there may be other reasons involved there. But participation rates are quite different across the various states. It also has to do with the age of each of the programs too. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Okay, so where have our data come from? Well, we've got student demographic data, as I mentioned. We've got online surveys that were distributed uh, via email. And we had, for, for researchers, pretty good response rates. They're not going to sound great to you guys, but uh, any day we can get 40% response rate on a survey is a pretty good day. It does mean, however, though, that when we draw conclusions from the survey data, as opposed to available public demographic data, it is an estimation and not an actual reflection of numbers. That'll come up in a minute or two when we talk about some of the characteristics of the participating schools. We also were able to hold uh, statewide focus groups. We had uh, the support from some third-party organizations that helped us really gain uh, access to a lot of these non-public schools uh, to get a chance to talk to their school leaders, their parents, uh, and we went around the state doing that. We went to about five different locations across the state to get a sense for how these folks were perceiving the program. And that was a pretty, it was a really important thing for us to do so that we could understand some of the nuances behind the survey numbers. And then last but not least, this past spring, with the cooperation of a lot of our uh, third party partners, with the cooperation of five public school districts, with the cooperation of, I think, 20 or 30, I'll have to get the, the right number, uh, non-public schools that were participating, and this is a lot of folks who had to agree to cooperate, we were able to administer uh, a, a nationally uh, normed uh, academic test to students who both received the Opportunity Scholarship Voucher and students who did not apply for it, and that's an important difference we'll talk about, but would have been eligible. We'll talk about that at the end. This is where all of our data comes from to this point, though. Let's talk about the participating students. And I think the tension here, when I looked at uh, the, the information we have at this point, is between eligibility versus uptake. What's the difference between being eligible and deciding to choose the voucher? And when we talk about participating students, we're, of course, talking about students and their families. It's not like second graders are making the decision on their own to take a voucher or not. All right. The first number is a bit tricky. And so this is part of why I wanted to present to you all to see if this makes sense to folks. And I've got Steve here to back me up if it doesn't. We wanted to take a look at what was the actual income of the recipients who were receiving the, the voucher. Now, as you know, the household income is going to vary uh, in, in terms of how important that is based on the size of a household. A household with an income of $30,000 for eight family members is very different from a household income of $30,000 for two family members. So one of the things that we did and taking a look at the household income number was to do what's called an adjusted household income. And this is the income divided by the square root of the number of people in the family. 
And we do, we do that for, for the, the reason we do that is to, to accommodate uh, different economies of scale, different size families. That's why it's not a straight division. Now, I've included it here because I wanted to compare it to uh, the adjusted household income of the families who either declined or did not accept one of the vouchers. And you'll see that it's quite a low number, $16,000. But of those who were uh, eligible and, but were non-responsive, and that's quite a large number, about 25%, their median adjusted income was slightly lower, which may tell us a little bit about that particular population. To give you some real numbers that are not adjusted, and Steve uh, ginned these up for me today, which is very helpful. Uh, for instance, the eligibility line for a family of two, a single parent and a child, is about $31,000 household income and I think from the year we did this the average for a family of two that applied was about twenty thousand dollars so about ten thousand below uh, what the the actual threshold number was something like that so one responsive meant they were eligible for the scholarship but didn't take it mm -hmm. and this is an interesting piece there's 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 uh, we do not have uh, it yet a significant number of, of students or families who have not had the opportunity, no pun intended, to receive the voucher because of the way that, it, that because of the amount of time it takes for NCSEAA to find the families who apply, and this includes this 25% that's not responsive, by the end of each academic year, pretty much to this point, everybody who's put his or her name in the hat has had the option to take the voucher. Just to clarify, the non-responsive, unresponsive families were families that had students in non-public schools? No, these are students who, these are families who applied for the, the Opportunity Scholarship, so they were in public school setting if they were eligible. Some might have applied and been ineligible, but they would have been in a public school setting if they were eligible. And then after the application and after the original awarding through the lottery process, NCSEAA was unable to find those families. Just having a little bit of difficulty. Sure. Just like a one later. Okay. Never mind. That's okay. I'm happy to. Th th this is not easy. <laughs> is it easier to think about these are people who the authority said you get your voucher and they did not take it yeah. for some reason or another? But that's the only thing about that population group was surveyed. They, you didn't test those students, you didn't do anything else. Yeah. So they're included but not included. And the reasons why they may not have been uh, uh, identifiable by NCSEAA could very well be. We have a number of reasons that we suggest in the report. There's mobility. Students could have students or families could have moved out of state. There's also a realization that happens for families who are first introduced to choice as an option. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but they start to learn about all the other fees and uh, responsibilities associated with that choice. So it could be that some of these families applied and then realized that the voucher not only didn't cover the entire tuition of the school they were interested in, but there were other fees as well. There's a number of reasons why they might have decided not to, to decline. But we don't know who they are or where they are, so we can't say much about that other than to speculate. Tripp? Yes, sir. You know, just one point on your adjusted household income. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're trying to We do. We do. So in the report, we have all the numbers available. Okay. It's just that for this for this one here, I wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to talk about the difference between the two groups. And I may make the change as a result of the conversation, but we wanted to see if it would work. All right. And I'm not sure what you're trying to get at with the division by the square root, because the, the tables in the law just have number of family members and eligible Income based upon two different thresholds. It's a bit of a, a slightly fairer comparison, and I'll defer to, to Steve on this because the larger a family gets, there's different economies of scale at play. So that a household income for two doesn't mean the same thing if it's doubled for four people because of the different uh, some of the ways that they're able to save money uh, across some of the expenses of the family. Is that fair? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. The reason we did that is simply as we wanted to be able to uh, uh, give a single number out. And the issue is that with the larger family sizes, the, the uh, income threshold can be quite large. I forget what they are, but 50 or 60,000. So if we just go in the data set and say, here's the median income of this group of families, it's going to look artificially large. People say, why, 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 why are these people getting the voucher? Look how much money they're making. It's like, well, no, you really, you have these different groups that are getting, uh, uh, that are eligible based on different family sizes. So if you want to give a single number and say, well, exactly, you know, how poor are these people, uh, you know, to answer that question, 
uh, we, we, we discussed this quite a bit and we thought, well, we'll do what is, what is typical, which is people will adjust for family size based on the square root of family size. So that we can then say, okay, here's the adjusted family size to give people some idea of exactly what this group of people look like. And that's why I bring Steve along. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> Interesting to me is that the number of ineligible applicants each year has remained relatively high. So there was some thought that as information about the program uh, expanded that there would be uh, more families that were applying with a better understanding of what makes one eligible or not. Uh, quite a few of those uh, have redeemed ineligible for reasons other than household income. So income was one of the thresholds, but it also could be that they applied even though their student was not enrolled in a, a public school the year before. Now again, we're only in our third or fourth year here so uh, of the program being implemented. So it could be that this is a learning curve piece, and there are other learning curve pieces we're going to talk about for some of these families too. All right. Where are the students coming from? There are not 97 counties in North Carolina with participating non-public schools. But there were students from 97 counties in this particular year, 1617, who accepted a voucher. That means that families are willing, in some of these cases, to do a little bit of traveling. Um, relative to the state as a whole, there were a greater proportion of elementary age students and a much smaller proportion of high school age students. For any of you who are parents, that might make a little bit of sense. Uh, moving your student out of a school setting where he or she has been for eight or ten years is a little more challenging socially for some of those students or emotionally than maybe moving a student who is new to a school system. That's one of the possibilities. We didn't dig much deeper on that, but it is worth knowing. There is a greater representation of African American students compare, comparable to the state as a whole, uh, and a, a smaller representation of Hispanic and white students comparable to the state as a whole. Um, I want to note, too, that a smaller proportion of surveyed non-public school leaders report that opportunity scholarship students are academically prepared, in their opinion, relative to leaders who report that their typical students are prepared. Now, that's a tricky statistic. That means when we ask them to tell us if they felt that the students that they inherited through the program were prepared for their schooling, eight out of ten or four out of five of those leaders said yes, but one out of five or two out of ten said maybe not yet. And they said about their own students who came to them for other routes, it was a little bit higher. But not, not a significantly a larger amount, but it is a notable difference that there is a perception among the public school, the private school leaders, that uh, the students who came to them uh, were not quite as ready for the academic rigor of their schools. Other factors for participation. One of the main reasons, one of the main uh, pathways along which p parents and students learn about this, even though there's uh, an advertising uh, a push every year, and even though there's a lot of information from uh, participating non-public schools and third-party groups, still th the strongest uh, way that information is shared is through uh, family and community information networks. That's what a lot of them report. They learn about the program through word of mouth whether that was a formal word of mouth setting or informal, the still in the third year looks to be, and we'll know more once we take a look at this year's surveys, the primary way by which parents and students learn about uh, this process. The timing of the application, the timing of non-public school enrollment periods really matters too. We heard this a lot from the non-public school school leaders. Many of them began filling their seats in January and February. The Opportunity Scholarship voucher lottery takes place about that time, but as I noted earlier, there's a long process for NCSEAA to make sure that all of the scholarships are awarded, and sometimes that carries on into the later spring, into the summer, and even into the next academic year. So there's a, there's a challenge for a lot of the participating schools because they have to make a decision, and they said this in our focus groups, about how many seats are we going to reserve from our normal placements in the anticipation of possibly getting an Opportunity Scholarship student. And that may play a factor for families as well. Families want to make decisions for their, their students uh, probably well before the end of the school year and certainly before the beginning of the next. And the farther you get down that line, the harder it is to make that choice. Also, there's a proximity uh, question for participating uh, non-public schools. A couple of things uh, to take a look at. So I've got the numbers up there of how many said that they learned about the program through friends or relatives and other means. A couple quotes from some of our participating uh, focus group members. 
Um, we did not know anything about the scholarship. I think a friend of ours told us was a common refrain we heard from a lot of folks the first time around. Uh, this was an interesting one though as well. And this, we heard in a number of different ways and variations, but I just pulled one as an illustration. Because of connections with our Spanish church, our Spanish pastors will give the information out to their Spanish members of the church. And there were a lot of other groups that were included in statements like that. That the church was one of the pathways through which a lot of these families learned about the possibility. There's much more in our, uh, our current report and our upcoming report about parents' uh, uh, responses to the program and about the students who are participating, but I wanted to just uh, have a, touch on just a couple. Uh, but if questions come up later, I can point to some of the things that we have in the report. What about the private school leaders themselves? And the tension for this group, I think it's fair to say, is largely between what's the mission of my school and what do I have to do to make sure that my school stability stays in play? And they're making that decision uh, in a lot of different ways. First of all, a little bit about the schools. And getting this, these, these particular counts, so if, if your numbers are three or four off from mine, it kind of depends on what time of the year you count, how many schools are participating, but it's in the ballpark. Uh, of the over 700 private schools across the state, about 224 enrolled uh, these students in the first year, and that was up to 359 last school year. So you see some of the growth there, not only in terms of the number of students who are accepting uh, the voucher, but also the number of schools who are enrolling. Worth noting, in each of those years, there were an additional about 100 other schools who were willing to enroll uh, some of the voucher students, but didn't have uh, families that applied to their schools. So uh, for instance, for uh, the 2014-15, there were 224 enrolling schools. There were another, what was it, uh, 109 who were willing to enroll had someone approach them about it. In survey information, and this is part of the challenge with the data that are available, there are more of the participating schools indicate that they have a religious affiliation. So of the participating schools, about three-fourths have a religious affiliation according to the survey results. Of the non-participating schools, less than half had a religious affiliation. Does that mean anything? Not necessarily. We just wanted to note that there are some differences in terms of the, the schools that choose to participate and those that don't. I could be much more precise with this figure if the data that we collect at the state level about our non-public schools were a little more rigorous. And I've been working really closely with the Division of uh, Non-Public Education. I think I got that title right. I never remember if it's department or division. Uh, the current leader for that division is terrific, and she's been extremely helpful as we've been trying to sort through the data. Getting data for past years has been trickier, and it's one of the challenges we'll talk about at the end. So I have to report this particular uh, data point from the survey results and not from uh, the actual numbers of, of counts across the state. One of the questions that came up early on in discussions about this uh, legislation and about this program was, if we offer this, will there be an uptick in the number of private schools? Will we see more private schools opening in response to having this financial support available? This is not conclusive or definitive, but I would say that the answer is leaning towards no. You will note that in the year of passage, 1314, and these are kind of small, sorry about that, there was a larger than usual number of new uh, non-public school openings, about 56. But look at the years before. There were 35 the year before that, there were 52 the year before that, and 40 the year before that. In the years that followed, there were still more schools opening, 39, 46, and 50. So yes, for the year the legislation passed, there was the highest number on record, but it was not the only year in which there was growth. A more important number, and one that we haven't had the time to unpack yet, is what is the net number of schools that are open? And this includes the schools that also close in any given year. And it is not uncommon in the, the non-public school sector for a handful of schools to close. In fact, I think the net each year is only about 10. So for every 40 that opened, there were 30 that also closed. Now, we have not done any analysis of where those schools are, uh, what types of school they were, what their financial situations were, nothing like that. So all we've done here is identified a question that we think is worth following up on. This is a map from 1516. We haven't been able to update it yet. It's a little hard to see because of the colors. The darker diamonds are participating schools in the 1516 year. The lighter diamonds were non-participating schools. It'll show you a little bit about the distribution of participating schools. It also shows you a little bit about the availability of schools. It's no surprise that the highest number of uh, recipients are in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg area, the Wake County area, even Fayetteville, because of the number of private schools that are available. 
But I will note that there are a couple of counties, especially in the Northeast, where there are uh, no participating schools or even no schools available at all or very few. So the, the decision to participate for a family uh, is also geographically based most likely. Do I have the capacity to get my student to the schools that are, are participating or even available to begin with? Uh, not all counties for the year that we counted uh, had a participating school, but I, I did note, however, the number of communities with enrolling schools has grown every year. And so if we look at just the post office address of the schools that were uh, accepting Opportunity Scholarship voucher students, there were 92 in that first year, and there were 137 communities by last year that had schools that were enrolling these students. A couple of takeaways from the private school leaders' perceptions. First of all, we wanted to know why they participated if they did. So when they took the survey, you know, we split them into different groups. They were the, 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 head, the heads of school of schools that were participating, that had participated before but no longer participated, that chose not to participate, or that were considering participating in the following year. Of those that participated, the vast majority said that it was moderately to very important for them to serve more disadvantaged students. And this is, again, talking about that tension between mission and stability. This is where you see some of the mission coming in for some of these schools, why they made the choice to participate. Uh, a lot of them said they wanted to provide an alternative to public school curriculum, but also they wanted to increase uh, the racial and socioeconomic status integration in their schools, more mission-driven. A couple quotes. I was a little leery at first of the program, not knowing about the program. The one thing I think that helped me to be more involved with it is that it's not dictating our curriculum, our standards of teaching in the Christian schools. So this was also something that mattered to them for participation. Would the rules of the program require them to make any changes to how they ran their schools? The program is bringing people who wanted desperately to have this opportunity to have the school choice. And these parents are delightful. They've added our culture. The children are delightful and wonderful and are doing wonderfully. These are for some of our focus group feedback. Lots of delightful and wonderful people in that school. <laughs> what about, though, the schools that didn't participate? What were some of their reasons or their concerns? One of the concerns was the possibility of future regulation that would change. And this is, again, back to that tension between uh, mission and stability. Right now, the statute uh, is written in such a way that we feel comfortable participating, but we don't feel comfortable or confident that it will remain that way. One of the areas they, they, they identified in particular was whether or not there would be changes to the rules about required testing, but that wasn't the only thing. They also noted uh, if, whether or not there would be changes in uh, the amount of funds that were provided. And that came up in the second one. So the possibility that the value of the voucher will not increase to match the increase of the cost to educate students. But how this came out in focus group settings were headmasters who said, when we bring a family into our school, we're bringing a family into our community. And we expect to have them there for as long as they wish to be. So if they come to us in one year and they have the, the voucher and it pays for a certain amount of their education, but that number changes or our tuition goes up, we are still invested in that family and we don't want to lose them because of a financial change. So they were making decisions about how many families can we bring in and support even if the value of the voucher changes or the cost of our education changes. How can we still be stable as a school? We don't want to bring in 20 families one year and then the next year say we can't afford to keep all 20. So that was one of the things that made them somewhat cautious about the program. The third thing, as I mentioned earlier, is the calendar. And I'm not sure how, I don't have a policy solution for this yet, but it's something that we talked to NCSEAA about and we talked to uh, the, the, the groups that run a lot of these schools that are participating. There is a challenge in the calendar because of how long it takes for the, the lottery to unfold. And that's largely because of the challenges that NCAA has in finding all of the people who apply to begin with. It's really challenging to match that up against these schools' calendars when they are trying to figure out how many seats they can reserve versus how many they have to field. Now that is a, a mechanical problem, it's not a philosophical problem, but it is one that is worth thinking about as, as, as folks think about whether or not there are changes to be made to the initiative. A couple of quotes from the focus groups. I think one of these is actually from one of the survey feedbacks. Uh, probably out, about out of every 10 people that we interview, only about three of them can actually afford the tuition. Now that was not of all of the families that they interviewed. These were the Opportunity Scholarship families. So in addition to uh, uh, just the, the support they get from the voucher, there are still some schools that found that even with the support, they were still not able to bring those families in. 
Uh, the board leadership of the school is concerned about the political entanglements that comes from receiving state and or federal funding. We heard that in a lot of different ways. Uh, we have concerns that opportunity scholarship students may require more resources than we have to offer. And that probably is a greater concern for smaller schools than larger. If we bring in a wider variety of students, do we have the resources necessary to provide them the education that we want to promise them? Okay. The last group from surveys and focus groups to learn a little bit about the uh, perceptions of the applicants' uh, families. And here, again, I wanted to present that possible tension. The tension here appears to be between having greater choice and also dealing with the, the additional costs. Why do they apply? This is what they tell us in the surveys, those who respond. And we had a much lower response rate for the families, and it was about 28% than we did for the headmasters. So we have an even smaller representative group here. But those who did respond said that they were dissatisfied with their public school quality, concerns about safety, and that came up quite a bit in the focus groups too. Uh, almost all said that educational quality was an important consideration. Uh, but only 33% said that extracurricular activities were very important. Uh, that's worth noting when we think about the different sizes of the schools and the different ranges of extracurriculars they're able to offer. It does matter to a lot of families, but not as much as a lot of other factors. The quality of our previous school was lacking. We planned to move to a smaller house and try to take on additional jobs to ensure he could return to a private school. We heard quite a bit of that in a, a lot of different ways, too. Folks who were strategizing about job changes or housing changes in order to either remain eligible or to afford or not afford a certain type of education. Uh, my husband and I would have taken on extra jobs or asked our family to help us pay the tuition. Our children's education is very important to us as well as their safety. Uh, quite a lot of those, these are reflective of the themes that came out in quite a lot of the focus groups. I did not mess up the formatting of the slide. There's going to be something on the right, I promise. <laughs> For those who did not use the, the scholarship voucher who were offered it and who were also willing to respond to us in our surveys, one of the main things they mentioned were the hidden or unanticipated costs. Now, for folks who are used to being in a non-public school setting, these are not hidden or unanticipated. You know that there are uniform costs sometimes, there are food costs sometimes, there are transportation costs sometimes, there are extracurricular costs sometimes. For these families, this is a new world for a lot of them. And so they know the tuition of the school to which they wish to apply, but don't realize that there are other expenses too. Now we'll be interested to see if that changes across years once there's more information out there about uh, 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 the, the, the voucher program, but also as the state becomes more educated in what it means to have a school choice option. This is something that our colleague Anna Egalite has talked a little bit about in some of her work is that the longer a program is in place, the more uh, sophisticated or nuanced some of the users might be about what it is they're getting into. And we're still in the, in the early stages of that. Uh, the net cost of tuition and fees was more than they could uh, handle. Um, where did they go? Well, quite a few actually ended up going to uh, non-public uh, schools through another means, either through a non-public school scholarship or they, or they made changes in their, uh, in their, um, their financial situation to make that possible. That doesn't make a lot of sense on the surface, but I think the graph I'm going to put up in a minute may help us learn a little bit more about that, and we're just supposing at this point. Uh, many return to traditional public schools or charter schools. This may seem out of place, but I wanted to point out what it, what it may imply, and we don't have anything definitive on this, but this is the number of schools considered by families who applied. And the vast majority only considered one school. And again, this is back to, uh, in some ways that's reflective of the number of schools that were available to them in their area, but it also is reflective of the fact that the idea of choice right now may be binary for folks, either my current public school or the one private school that I found that works for me. And it may mean that if you go through this process and you only had one <laughs> private school that you wanted to apply to but the, the numbers didn't work out, then there wasn't an option. You, you hadn't gone through the process of identifying other schools to which you would apply. Because remember, this calendar has already moved along. Those applications have happened. And when you apply for the voucher, you need to say what school or schools you've applied to. So we'll be interested to see if these numbers change too. If over time, more families who are interested in this put their name in the hat for more than one school. Okay, this is the last little bit, and I'm really close to running out of time, so I want to be sure to save a little bit of time for questions. I want to tell you what we're trying to do about moving towards that last piece of the puzzle, which is understanding a little bit about the academic impact of the scholarship. Our goal in any work like this, and this is uh, true for all the activities we do in research, is to try to estimate what we consider unbiased measures of academic impact. 
And that unbiased piece is the challenging part. To get a truly unbiased estimate for the impact of any program, whether it's opportunity scholarship or anything else, what we need most is a random group of students, some of whom, all of whom, want to do whatever the initiative is, in this case, to take uh, the voucher, but only some of whom are awarded it. If we have a group like that, where there are more who wanted it than got it, we can factor out motivation and family uh, thoughts and, and approaches to schooling and a lot of other things that we have to guess at when we do our estimations. Now because of the way that the, the program has played out, and especially that piece about awarding the scholarships, we've never had that situation yet. Now this is a new program, but by the end of each year so far, everybody's had at least an option. And we can't always find all the students who have declined, so we don't have them available. Because of that, it poses a challenge for uh, us as we try to make any kind of unbiased estimate, because then we start having to bring into our equations and our modeling different variables to explain different reasons for kids to do certain things, and, and the strength of the model then depends on whether or not we pick the right variables. And what we end up with is what a lot of you are familiar with when we hear uh, research results for education policies, there's a he said, she said effect, where there's a group that has evidence that something works, and a group that has evidence that something doesn't. And you wonder how they can come up with such different conclusions. It's the world we live in. We're used to it because we have to struggle with this as researchers. We have to try to do the best we can to get out of that conversation. But really, there's only one way for that to happen. All of that is to say that right now, even doing the best that we can, we will not be able to provide a wholly unbiased causal estimate of the academic impact of the program. But we've done the best we could. And here's, here were some of the things that we would that, that keep us from getting there, but that we've, kind of, we've tried to overcome. There's no common test measure. So because the, the participating schools are able to uh, take any nationally normed test, there are a number of different tests out there. And then the public school students who would have been eligible also are not taking those same tests. That makes it a bit of a challenge. We've overcome that in one way, then we'll talk about that. Uh, there's no compulsion or incentive currently for any of these folks to participate. So we have, and especially on the non-awarded side, so if you want to have that comparison group of students who are eligible but did not take it, we have to rely on them voluntarily agreeing to participate in the testing. And that's asking a lot, especially in a state where regardless of whether you're in a public school or a private school, we're all quite sensitive to over-testing. Uh, so there's no, there's no compulsion for either group. And there's also right now not enough funding to do this well. We were very fortunate this year to have uh, private funds from three different sources, one national and two state, to help us pay for this type of work. But that meant a lot of hours on the road for us traveling to about 20 or 30 different schools and then also all of the, the, the um, uh, all of the time spent on scoring, and we're still in the midst. We thought we'd be finished by now, but the data are, are quite challenging doing the analyses themselves. Uh, we've overcome uh, some of these things. I, I want to note, too, I, I want to be sure to give a, a, a credit to all of the groups who came together to make it possible for us to do this last spring. We had participation from five major school districts, public school districts. And these are groups that were not interested in doing this the first couple of years. Uh, but we had ongoing conversations, built relationships with them. I do a lot of work at these schools anyway in other settings, and got them to a point where they were willing to participate. We had, with the help of some, uh, some third-party groups here in the state that advocate for this program, uh, a lot of help getting access to a lot of the private schools. When I started this work in my first year, the response to me from the, the participating schools, I got responses from two. Who can blame them? You, you, you want to be cautious about who you let inside your house. Uh, as a result of our work with our outside partners and of building these relationships, I think we ended up in about 20 or 30, and that didn't even include the ones that, that did the focus groups with us. We had incredible support from the Department of Public Instruction which provided us all of the necessary data that we have to have in order to do the background uh, work on the kids who participated. And they were under no obligation to do that either. We had unlimited support from uh, NCSEAA, which is woefully understaffed for this initiative, but continues to meet our every need in terms of figuring things out. And then I mentioned earlier the relationship that we we're developing with the Division of Non-Public Instruction. All of these things mattered, and all of those things had to come together in order for this to happen. Okay, what we were able to do was to do some testing in spring 2016-17. We had uh, a lot of support from different groups. 
Uh, we also had volunteer participation from non-public and public schools. Now that matters. Volunteers are quite different from a sample of the entire population. So already there's a bias there that we're aware of. However, we were able to administer a common test. Now we weren't particularly hung up about which test it was. In this case, we deferred to a well-known nationally normed test that also had a short version because we wanted to be as minimally, minimally disruptive as possible. So a lot of you may be familiar with the ITBS. We're not endorsing that test. I'm just noting that it provided us with a, a tool for minimizing the impact on both our public and private partners. We also have the provision of historical data from DPI. Uh, and what's coming next will be initial correlative, but not causal, results. And we'll have to talk about when those come out, what that means and what we can and can't say from that. So we've used part of this uh, effort this past year to make it clearer, we hope, as once we were able to share some of these findings, uh, what it takes to come up with really conclusive results, what we're currently able to do and what the gap is between getting from here to there. Now that doesn't mean that the state or the program has to make that adjustment, but it does mean that for those who are interested in getting uh, uh, some results that are less arguable, that there are some steps that still could be taken at the state level to make that happen. As you saw from earlier slides though, any change in the structure of the program might have the, re the effect of changing the schools that are willing to participate. So there's always gonna be a give and take there between how much we can really say about the impact versus people's willingness to participate, and we'll have to figure out as a state where that line should be.